It's interesting because you've created a, a show called Legends and Visionaries. It's this idea of matching a classic work with a brand new work, emerging choreographers. Talk about that, that idea and, and that vision that you have for the company. What we try and do is bring um, ballets that aren't often done anymore, that I think are important in a choreographer's history, that you see this progression of a ballet that's maybe a smaller ballet that's extremely intimate and how it goes into the larger ballets and then we put it against new ballets by emerging choreographers and I think that you can see where the dance is headed, where the future is headed and I think that that's an important thing. We can't be a museum and we can't just do new. I would say also that a chamber ballet, the kind of chamber ballet that you are offering this intimacy, really allows the audience to understand ballet in a different way. Ideas about character, relationships, spacing, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Well, I think it's a different experience. If you go to the Met, which is absolutely fabulous, it's a different experience watching theater and dance in a smaller setting. It's more personal. And I think that's important. I think there should be many experiences in the theater. And when it's very personal and it's really for you, you're on top of it, you're becoming part of the story because you're right there, or part of the experience. With Song Before Spring, it does feel at a very certain level that it's a personal ballet as well, something that comes from both of you. So the question I had was, how did you develop the partnership and how did you then develop the material? Our, our partnership developed in the way most um, partnerships do on on a on a napkin <laughs> in a, in a coffee shop. Um, uh, ZJ and I uh, decided that we would get together and sort of talk about what we were going to do with this music and what kind of a ballet we wanted to create together. And so we went for coffee. And um, I had only just met ZJ actually maybe five minutes before, and she asked me with the pen in her hand what are you most afraid of? And from there, our conversation sort of developed in this very roundabout way to this ballet. So in this ballet, you're bringing together of what feels like a very urban scene, a lot of people, a lot of action, a lot of busyness going on the stage. Um, but at the same time, there is plenty of tenderness. There are plenty of moments of pause. How did you develop those ideas? Um, if you have lived in New York City, you might would know that there were always uh, musicians underground, and um, there's this one uh, artist who always play steel drum. So when I first hear the music, I automatically remember that. I'm glad to be able to use Philip Glass's music to deliver uh, a sense of humanity and somehow through his music although it's always um, the same tone but there's so much if you listen closer there's so much emotions involved um, that we may don't know uh, what's behind the music and just like humans we we you may see someone seems fine but he might going through a bad day or something so yeah it's interesting your choice of the score because philip glass this particular series of etude i somebody told me yesterday when they were listening to the piece that it just entranced them they felt spellbound by it that their heart started beating and in some ways it feels very contemporary in that way, I mean, very reflective of, of, say, New York City as you're describing it. Why were you interested in working with the glass score? Well, there's something really interesting, I think, about the, the opposition of the minimalist music and the very not minimalist steel drums. They're, they're very, very forward. They're very loud. They're very present, and they give uh, the idea that this kind of music could possibly be something that you uh, get lost in, um, a very different meaning. And I think when, the, when you add the dance to it, when you add the, the movement and the characters on the stage, 
then you sort of get pulled between um, what what level of consciousness we're, we're in. You know, are, are we in the level of consciousness where we listen to minimalist music and let that wash over us? Or are we in the level of consciousness where we are very aware that something is happening because it's loud and forward and in front of you? So a question about the uh, duets between Joshua and Daniel, the male duets, and your, your ideas behind creating male duets. I thought it would be interesting to present the dynamic that two men might have with each other. And I tried to explore maybe two men as brothers, or two men as a father and a son, or two men as lovers, or two men as co-workers, or two men as a boss and an employee, or two men as any number of ways that you might find two men that interact with each other in the world. Um, and I, I think that perhaps a little bit because of the time we're in, uh, it's important to to step away from conventional ideas of what two men are supposed to be. And I, I don't know, I hope that that comes through and I hope that that's something that people are interested in seeing. I'm certainly interested in exploring it. So a dual question. One, is there some kind of recording of the earliest uh, performances of Dark Elegies, and how do you work more particularly? Is it all what you've stored through your experience that comes, that comes out, or are you working from different kinds of scores? Well, when we um, stage an older ballet, I always try and get the person who's danced it furthest down the line, so we don't use film except for little details that might be forgotten. Um, so we had someone come in and stage this for us that knows the ballet very, very well. There are numerous films of the ballet, and each film is slightly different. You know, when Tudor was alive, he didn't stick to just this one way, and you had to do it. This cast did it exact, this cast did it exactly the same as that cast. He worked with the dancers, but you, oh, in my experience, always gave him exactly what he wanted. Can you talk about the choice of using piano and baritone for this Kindertottenlieder? Well, for us, I, we couldn't do the full set. We don't have the backdrop. So it had to be a, really a concert version. And I think it's very important to do it live and not do it to a recording. So I think since it is a very intimate theater, the production becomes intimate. And I think just solo piano and singer was the way to go that, to bring out that essence of it. The use of the floor plans is pretty phenomenal when you look at the geometry of the space mm -hmm. and the way that the dancers, I mean you guys are so expert in this particular piece, how did you get them into that mode? I don't know if Tudor ever really thought of it, the plans like that. I think he t thought of this, the inside, because I think when you do Tudor, it's not about you. You have to, it's from the inside out. It can't be about the individual dancer. It's about the person. Um, there's this uh, thing that Tudor said that I always try to tell my dancers. Um, towards the end, he said, you know, I only get dancers who are trying to be people. I don't get people who happen to dance. <laughs> 